up early, but um, I felt like giving a talk. <coughs> so it's the 999th episode. Um, and the title that came to me was 3018 Characteristic of the Storyteller. And so I find myself since 2014 kind of being drawn to the realities behind my eyes. Uh, uh, not realities behind my eyes, but uh, I became more sensitive of language. And as I began expressing what felt to be my inner realm, vocal, vocalizing them externally, I began to discover a, a sort of new relationship with language. It, it seemed like it's kind of like this with everything, I think. In, um, who is that guy? I think it's Robert Greene who says you need 10,000 hours of mastery. To master anything, you need to practice something 10,000 hours. Now, if you think about it, let's take writing, for example. If you were to master writing, which is still a use of language, um, what is occurring is that imagine you wrote 10,000 sentences. The first couple sentences, you'd be worried and concerned about you know, how you wrote them, how they will be engaged and whatnot. But after like the 100th like, sentence, you'd be suddenly realized you, the deeper questions of the um, craft uh, c uh, come into your attention. And so it's as if it's like, how am I writing something? Or you can say, how am I living? And so it's, it's kind of unique because um, in my experience, as I wrote, I began discovering an inner voice. This inner voice is different. The way I'm using the word inner voice here is different than how I normally use it. Normally, I use it to kind of point to the logos, <coughs> uh, the inner guiding voice. You know, usually I speak about it this way. But this was more kind of like, um, it's like the first couple you do for others, you, when you're practicing something, you're trying to attain the perfection of another, uh, of another. Eventually, after coming to an authentic engagement with the problem, intelligence will begin possessing access. And so the person who writes the 1,000th uh, sentence suddenly realizes that there is a freedom there is a freedom that the words are not just meant to be a response to the environment. The, you know, you, you, the life kind of, um, you become more grounded in your own experience rather than in the, uh, just being grounded in the conceptions of your experience. wasn't proper um, there's a chance it was very faint what I was saying but anyways I'll continue there isn't much I can do at this point <coughs> you practice something anything you're right now a human being your intelligence has been able to kind of conceive relationships and extract relationships out of your world and so there are certain actions that come to a person. That means whoever you are in this world, regardless of how you judge yourself or how others judge you, there are certain actions. You know, it's like human intelligence is capable. It may not be capable to a sort of com a comparative perfection, but it is capable. Every living being, just like how you can move, your mind can move as well. So... For example, as I started writing many sentences after another, not, not with the intent to master. To be honest, you can't, you won't have enough inspiration. Those people who just want to succeed in, in an ego-driven way, their hard work will be limited. You only, in, uh, it's like only an e a great effort of endurance comes when something is important enough. Sometimes things are important for others, and when we find ourselves in that environment, we feel that what, what is important for them has to be important for us. You know, but to find the voice of your own eyes, the sight of your own speech. There is a pleasure in it. I don't want to say pleasure, but there is a joy in uh, smooth progress. I don't know how to say it.
I began realizing that at first I was writing with structure in consideration. After you become familiar with the structure, all those complex structures become like a new simple alphabet. And then what you do is you use that. So you can say, if you can categorize two concepts in one concept, do you know? It's like next time you don't need to say, like for example, two concepts, you just say one. You know, and so it, it, I feel it's just the repetition of an experiential engagement with the phenomenology and therefore observing more and more and more until you realize that there is a creative allowance in the action. Many things people may be identifying right now with that is not, has nothing to do with their free will. You know, it's as if they, they haven't asked the question and um, because they are given others answers, you know, the answers of others. I feel really like Rene Descartes, he said at least one, at some point, in, I mean, I'm kind of saying it in my own way, but what he, what he was saying was at least some point in your life, doubt all things. <clears throat> and the reason he said doubt all things is not per se for you to doubt the systems outside of you, but, but to kind of see how the free will component was expressed. Sorry guys, this was on mute and I was just talking. That's, uh, that was a bit tragic, but anyways. I was pretty much su suggesting that I was, uh, I wanted to get to the center 
kind of like I felt like sharing the central point of this talk, that when someone shares a story, the characteristics of that story are animated in accordance to their own experiences. So the cool thing is, even though we have a lot of technologies as a species, a lot of things that are accessible, to realize that we are not identified by them is actually the advancement of the civilization. You know, that means in, you got to think about it. An advanced civilization is another way of saying we create a civilization that can respond to its moments at, in advanced ways. You know? So when you wonder what is an advanced kind of action, an advanced action is an action that has observed all the potential probabilities of the reality as much as is accessible and then out of that spectrum of choice makes a decision also consider it that the unknown is always there so it's kind of like if you think about the rationalization of human living uh, how a human being rationalizes life it's like an equation and so the concept of consciousness soul metaphysics metaphysics was all centered around uh, how this equation of life that the person's kind of formulating. I mean, really, life is a bunch of formulas. You don't realize it because it's so ingrained. Uh, every person's behavior can be ascribed to a formula, I believe. I believe psychology can be mathematically explained, but I think um, the years of 2020 are not ready to hear me say it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, please be mindful. I mean, really what I'm attempting here with these talks is that um if thoughts were an object, I am trying to look at them from different angles. And really, I'm just saying that the storyteller's design is, I'm not suggesting per se a kind of monotheistic conclusion here, but I'm saying that it's like just a person. We take a person, when they share a story, that story is animated in accordance to their own experiences. So when I say look in the mirror, I am telling people in some sense a recognition that language is meaning. The object in front of your eyes, that is not like a mirror. That's an object, you know. But when I say what, what the mirror part is, is how the subjectivity is linked to that object. How language becomes reality. So it's kind of fascinating because the human being can I wonder, let's say there are thoughts, and uh, you know, even though I, I don't see thoughts as static, as like, how can I tell you, like a thought is, um, is a moment of reception, a dynamic moment of reception, rather than a <clears throat> purely static phenomena, you know.
we live through stories. Stories are sparked out of a some some percentage of experiential relevance uh, uh, relevance to existence. And so really, it's as if our experiences are evoking the communication that animates. So the Buddha kind of looked at objective phenomena and said its nature is empty. And people are like, what do you mean it's empty? This, this object is, how, how is this object empty? It's an object. And Buddha, was, Buddha said that this object can be perceived by many people. Two people can look at the same cup of tea, let's say it's not hot tea, and one person sees iced tea, one person sees like warm tea. That means we can look at the same liquid, but our estimation of its temperature, if it's not steaming, is going to be in the ambiguous. So this kind of suggests that certain parts of life, there is more no we know things more about it than we don't know, and certain moments of life we don't know more about some things. Um, hey, Wins, um, <laughs> I mean, language is, we can dress ourselves up in many ways. The best thing is that, uh, to realize one communication in one moment is not the definition of the whole intelligence. The same way we have a relationship with thought. That means you can visualize, if I tell you visualize a shape, or you yourself want to just visualize a shape, you can. <clears throat> and strangely, it's as if it, our imaginations are domain. It's like the, free, the same free will that when your hand moves, when you want to grab an object, it's kind of with the same sort of free will effort, the subjective projection arises. So if there is the same free will, <clears throat> that means instantly I visualize a triangle like or sphere or whatever, you know, you can visualize. <clears throat> that unconditional freedom behind our eyes makes our attention seem like the God of thought. So where my attention goes, that the, becomes the scope of reality, do you know? And I found it very fascinating that in certain mystical traditions, their fascination, their teachings, it's like, was not on just an ideological level. They were seeking an ultimate experience, kind of like you see in these shows, like the guy wants to power up, you know. So this power up ultimately led them to questioning the room they were in, you know. And really, there's two positions, I find. That means all of knowledge. <laughs> I mean, this may be a bit bold of me to say, but I feel all of knowledge is a relationship with the, of the known with the unknown. And anyone who realizes this realizes certain domains of thought are held on thin ice. Certain, sometimes language is hollow. The same way Buddha said, for example, the object is, uh, doesn't have a nature of its own. Your eyes, by seeing the object, imbue it with a nature. Similarly, I'm saying we, we are imbuing uh, uh, symbols of the alphabet with, um, with the soul of an image. You know, so suddenly a bunch of letters together are like a world behind them. Do you know, or they, they, they activate certain things. Oh man, tell me this isn't on mute. <laughs> okay, it's not. <laughs> you see, I think there is no downfall. 
I think evolution, if we entertain an evolutionary notion, believe it or not, it's just progress. So it, it, you can, the, 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 it's kind of realizing all judgment originates from a dualistic axis. Now, who holds that dualistic axis? You know, I remember, <laughs> I, I got to share this kind of personal thing, guys. Um, um, so I, I, I have, um, um, you know, I have, I have a nice collection of friends. And sometimes, you know, well, we go into debates. And I remember there was a time where every debate we had went to everybody pointing to each other. Yo, it's your ego. You have an ego. That sentence is being said from an ego. It's like it, it was, it was, it became the kind of... <laughs> Kind of beca- it, like all philosophical speculation at that point just became pointing at the ego in the room, and I dislike that. I kind of you got to understand when I'm sharing these talks, I don't uh, identify as uh, as a purely creature of experience. So what I mean by that is I'm speaking as if I'm a designer, you know, as if I, my interest in, in in speech is through its design. I often say language has architecture for me, you know, a good sentence is like an incredible building, you know, because of the images it sequentially evokes. So I'm, I'm, I, I've reached a point where it's like, yeah, sure, the, the child psychology starts off dependent on the warmth and nourishment of its environment. So the child is dependent. The child, it's like its first duality is hot and cold. You know, it's its temperature. It's it's like the existential body adjusting to the ecosystem that it has just entered. Imagine a child just born and crying. You know, so we see. So so the child starts off with conditional at growth. That means its advancement and evolution. Just subconscious. The subconscious uh, will kind of always bow to nature. Um, so guys, I'm going to quickly respond to the chat section. When, wins, wins art. Listen, there is no problem with having an ego. There is no problem after 4 billion years of evolution to identify with language. My concern is not to worship it. Do you know, not to constantly have battles of subjective portraits of the world you know it's all about attitude to be honest because i'm telling you there like from the age uh winsard i'll tell you something interesting from from 2015 in 2014 i started these talks from 2015 to 16 i could tell you that was I I went through the this whole phase where I noticed all 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 these ancient teachings ultimately pointing finger at an inner rascal, you know. And so I'm I'm telling you I, I'm speaking as if there is nothing wrong with existence. We don't want to start off with a position. Oh, that that's imbalance, you know. Of course, we like let's say the world is in chaos right now. Let's say we open our eyes and it's the most chaotic world. What do we do? What do we do? We either will go and move in the chaos, you know, or we resist. So ultimately, all of life's actions are, are you embracing or are you resisting? Are you embracing or are you resisting? Now, when it comes to the inner realms, your resistance can amplify to many parallel memories simultaneously evoking a new emotion, you know? People think that emotions are like set from before. They're like colors and, oh, I got a red kind of emotion. I got, I felt blue. I got a blue emotion, you know? So, so, so it's not emotions I feel are rare. They are unique. They are never the same. Even though we share the same human design, even though all our blood is red, you know, even though we all breathe. Do you know? We are united by the nature of our design, yes, but in regards to our inner lives, it doesn't mean that. It's kind of, let me tell you, um, ancient enlightenment, I have an incredible respect for it. You guys will understand this when you hear my talks. But I'm saying that it's not the end, you know? That means stop um, looking 
for balance um, subjectively. The language, the, the ling the, I call it the uh, linguistic simulation, it's evocational. Do you know? That means somebody could come and tell you one story one day, they evoke that imagery. So you are like, okay, okay, I see this image. You know, and then the next day somebody else comes and somebody else comes and somebody else comes and you're like, whoa, 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 what is this? What is this endless world building going on behind my eyes by the voices of others and even sometimes my own attention? So so I ultimately realized it's it's like if any person is drawn towards spirituality. So um Windsor, um, off, uh, I can't tell what you are responding to. Um, so sometimes you can share in, in, in relation to what. But um, I've, I've followed you so far. Like I understood what you're saying in the chat section. I'm, guys, it, it's not about, I'm telling you, the ego game is boring. You know the ego game can be infinite. You know, you can endlessly, the mind can animate uh, a, a shadow behind the door. Uh, Hidden door, a hidden door, a hidden door, a hidden door. The mind is very advanced, you know. Spirituality is interestingly, uh, Windsor, as you say, it has a bad name. It has a negative connotation because it was, I say, in philosophy, there are two great traps. And one is the nihilistic trap, the other is the enlightenment trap. The enlightenment trap is when the person, this is the wrong way to kind of um, drive the light in your eyes, you know. <laughs> the enlightenment trap is when your attachment to the uniqueness of the subjective phenomenology that has arose for you, experientially even, is as an escape. That means if you still subconsciously want to go to heaven, you may suddenly appear as the most person, like act as like suddenly, suddenly become compassionate. Like I'll tell you, I, I, when I was in India, I saw something strange. I saw a lot of Western people had, had come and it was as if they had denied themselves. It's as if they were rejected and so they wanted to escape the environment they were rejected rather than realizing the whole point of existence is to march on. That's it. There's only one thing you can do in this life and go forward. You know, many things will happen. Many interpretations of chaos. It's like waves of an ocean. You know, I, I kind of said it that in my youth it felt to me like uh, literally my eyes opened. Information, 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 eyes closed. It's like eyes open, design of life, design of life, story, emotion, story, emotion. It's like various shifts and then sleep. And so it kind of became that it's like my waking state was just the change of design ultimately. So there can be a, a totally kind of, there can be definitely philosophies that take the human being out of the need to be human. Do you know that's, that's still is escapism? So the kind of metaphysics, at least, I am subconsciously implying in these talks of mine is not a metaphysics that is ignoring objective reality. It's not like we're, we are forgetting about evolution. We're like, okay, we're, we're eternal beings. We don't need to do anything. Why does an eternal being need to do anything? It's like eternity is the most, it's like the truth, the ultimate, you know? It's like, how can an eternal being die? You know, so why do I need to do it? Like the, the, these are these are escapisms through the sense of that an ideology has given you a cape, and it kind of fits in with the idea of language's mask. You gotta understand, as I'm speaking, there is no way to speak without having an ego. You cannot speak if you don't identify with an individual consciousness. You know, and any identification with the individual consciousness is, is really uh, a sort of image of self. Oh, no, no, feel free. Uh, Windsor, feel free. Treat, treat the chat section of um, this talk as if it's like the school of Athens and it's like philosophers can talk as much as they want about anything. So it, it's okay, you know. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is that Alan Watts, if you're familiar with it, I think you are, 
Windsor. Uh, Alan Watts says ego is just the attention to that self in that moment. That means any time in your life that you have had to consider yourself as an individual in a world, ego, it's like, what are you going to do? The ego's there. <laughs> So, so I realize you only want to get rid of the ego. You only want to get rid of um, the current meaning because either you cannot see it or you see something else. And it's very rare that people see something else. That means to see something beyond this plane of existence of ours, I feel it moves beyond uh, the language threshold and therefore it's not, it's not ideological. Do you know what that means? That means... Uh, there's a huge chance that rather than us being particles in a in a like just in the, our intelligence arising from the particle that we are the you know it, it arises from the particle is being moved by the field and I experienced this in nature when I threw a ripe apple into a river and the river kind of was intelligence for that apple I'm like oh my god that apple has fallen into rhythms of greater intelligence. So if there are other dimensions, I feel those rhythms of intelligence will take the human being beyond uh, ideology. It, 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 anything beyond duality is beyond the language threshold. Language is a dualistic system. This is why in the moment you speak ego, <laughs> the moment you, you, you take shape, in this world, people will think it's an ego, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, the word ego is outdated, you know. But at least one way I, I say something nice about the ego, that it's also like an egg. That if it breaks from the outside, there is no life. If it breaks from the inside, there is life. If your transformation occurs from your you, if you... There, something happens to your field of intelligence, uh, to your, um, it's like either the world is moving you or you are moving the world. The moments in life where you are moving the world, I consider that to be the inner life of the person, you know, the subjective realm. The moment life is moving you, well, it's the, you know, it's the outer realm. Like who's gonna who's gonna fight gravity? <laughs> you know, there was a there was a king, I in and a sort of emperor in ancient Greece who declared war. This like king declared war on Poseidon, and so they of course they entertained the notion of gods, right? And so this king uh, orders his army, you know, his greatest men, his strongest warriors, to go and attack the sea. So you see a bunch of grown men with swords constantly hitting the water, you know, trying to stab the water, trying to like offend Poseidon, you know. And so the fact that that guy was thinking, the, that emperor was thinking he was uh, uh, kind of like dishonoring Poseidon was his inner reality. The outer reality people are meaninglessly just hitting metal to water, you know. Interesting. Language is, I'm just saying it's an Iron Man suit we're raised in, and at some point you can step out of it and you observe. Uh, you see, I noticed something in life. The, the point of life is not having any problems. It's not, it's not to not have any problems. People who feel that everything should be perfect all the time, I kind of feel it's scary, those people who want to be happy all the time. Because it means they have to be blind to the chaos if you want to identify with a certain order. If you want your own, a certain belief to be true, do you know? So you got to reject the other beliefs because then it's like, you, it's like somebody's pushing you out of a house you've stayed in for a while. A lot of people stick to certain ideologies, not per se, because it's, it's rational or irrational, because they have lived in that ideology for a while. Their personality is based on how that subjectivity was a part of the context of their world in, in, in their childhood, for example.
language is a Windsor. I'll tell you in the chat section. I'll tell you, language is a technology. That's my my um, my at least I'll say my ultimate resolution of it. Oh, that's pretty much all that it can be. It's a technology, but it's an inner technology, and it's a technology where it, where the dimensions are conceived out of. For example, before mathematical language, we could not read. Before there was establishment of mathematics, I don't know how people could read because you got to acknowledge this is one sentence, this is this, uh, sorry, this is one word, and this is another word, and this is another word. So what that means is it's like <clears throat> there requires, you know, this is what they're not teaching in the West. They're not teaching mathematics as a language. They're not telling children that they can express themselves through. Uh, uh, their subconscious is, is if, 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 believe it or not, a lot of things have a strange ma uh, mathematical precision to them. And the mathematical precision, of course, it's in the realm of imposition. So it's like how you see something, or, or Henry David Thoreau said it the best. He said, it's not what you're looking at that matters, it's what you see. It's not what you're looking at that matters, it's what you see. So that's, that seeing part is raw experience. So ultimately, we are minds in the silence that have found in dwelling in the silent leads nowhere, and kind of it's the communication, the effort of communication. Uh, I feel our civilization can totally be redesigned, and it should. Because the freedom of speech is another way of saying freedom of various designs of communication. What is speech but images? That means, I don't know, like uh, I've listened to many lectures on, on the internet and when I've listened to them, I, would, I, like, I didn't care about who the person was. I'm like, okay, what, how do these concepts project this sort of an image? How, do, how, does, how does language become a movie behind my eyes? And so there is, you know, this is one thing I realize, guys, intuitively, when I say intuitively, that I mean like experientially, I realize you cannot hide in thought. You cannot hide in definition for too long. The way nature is designed, we're not meant to be a certain shape. So it's the ability to discern. To discern that it's like right now, do you go up to a tree and just shout, ego, ego, this tree's got an ego. <laughs> you know? The, it, it, you don't. So you see, in an, uh, you didn't react to the object. Now, if you can also be similarly, see that you cannot react to a subject, it's it's like it's 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 like kind of like the way I experienced it uh, was that uh, in 2011 I sat on a rock and I suddenly the question came, who is looking through my eyes, who is looking through my eyes right now, right? And that question, my mind kept throwing answer after answer after answer, you know. And then I was like, how could these answers be me when I'm constantly having a new response to who am I? My mind is thinking various projections, so I kind of got acquainted that. It, 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 we are a dynamic thing and all these language wars that are going up are distractions from our own experiences and the value they can have in civilization. So if one can say that, at, uh, like I say at least, <laughs> attention is the god of thought, attention evokes language, Just like how we feel we are free to create and generate any design, you kind of feel just like how you have an imagination. What if we are the imagination of the mind of another dimension? You know, philosophy is brilliant because ultimately... Ultimately, vision commands life force. 
And where is vision? That means really, if we don't move and we don't make a noise, how can you have an ego? It is only in the domain of speech and movement, sound and movement, that we animate into individuals. So really, we are observers, attributeless observers, and as we, as this attention navigates, pilots throughout the day, through various states of mind, it identifies and can identify with the content of the experience. So what I'm saying is, it's like the story of your life becomes like, you realize, whoa, it's like just a photo of a moment. You know, we can say if it's like a person looking at something and getting a thought is like someone putting a camera in front of something and recording it, you know, taking a photograph. And that photograph means that the person looked at a dynamic process and extracted solidity, uh, a, a static result, you know. Because ultimately, <clears throat> we are creatures on a rock that we discovered language. Just like how the caveman discovered fire. Even though I believe the caveman discovered fire because of lightning, like they didn't use tools at first. But I feel maybe, maybe there came a time or maybe they actually used tools, who knows. <clears throat> Just like how fire, we created a tool and we made fire, we have created language and we have made the story of the personality. And I have, my, my realization is that language can become hollow and you shouldn't fear it when it does. Sri Ramana Maharshi says, all that you have learned, um, there will come a moment where all you have learned must be forgotten. What does that mean? That means we are not just alive to identify with the happiness of creation all the time. It's like as an advanced civilization has a sophisticated awareness to how systems are ending. In, in, in the civilization, how systems change and how systems begin. And if you in your own life wondered about the dimensions of your life and realized at some point it has to do with how much you have reached, <clears throat> life is really fascinating. Marcus Aurelius had a quote where he said, the soul is dyed with the colors of its thoughts. And it's as if in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras also, they say consciousness is like an orb, like a glass orb moving over colored cloths. So what we think is the ego <clears throat> is how this orb is in one moment identifying with a certain color. This orb of consciousness is identifying with a certain color underneath it. This glass orb. <clears throat> this is a metaphor, of course. So <laughs> Um, Windsor, I can't comprehend the, the thing, what you're writing, if you can rewrite it. Okay, I see. So that is this. Okay, okay, I, I totally understand what actually, I, I see what you're saying with that quote. So let's say you're a person who have come into a resolution that you have become the Tao. That means if I ask you who you are, you just stare at me in silence. Okay, let's say you, you are um, 
um, the, you're staring at the moment through the eyes of the soul of the soul of the soul, you know? The presence of everything that is present, you know? <clears throat> so, I this is the thing, that I was strangely, I went towards the, you can say, mountain of mysticism, and as I reached a certain degree of this mountain, I realized that it turns into a round circle. So what that means is you're going to realize it, there was nothing ever wrong from the beginning. And when you come to that state of mind, really it means novelty has ultimate freedom. Yeah, so that who is where I say I've created a term I call it the language threshold. That uh, the who is in language beyond it in any when when you go to a when you're trying to define a non-dual experience. Good luck, you're tr you're trying to d uh, measure the sky. <laughs> so language breaks in in the presence of the experiencer. But I'm saying, let's say you hover, you hover non-dualistically your state of mind hovers non-dualistically you go into this world kind of like there's no people anymore everything is just one phenomena one 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 will of one you force you know you know it's like yoda never needed a cane you know I, I feel when you truly enter emptiness, that's when you realize the value of how life is full. There is this uh, behavioral pattern that is kind of like a mass hallucin hallucination of people around the world. And what is this mass halluc hallucination? Is that because they have not confronted the empty, they feel the world owes them. Until you truly can confront the empty, the zero dimension, I don't know how you can be comfortable with phenomenology. Because fear is something that is only there because the context has not, uh, has, has not, again, stared in the mirror. So it's another implication that everything that is happening right now Yes, you can ascribe it to an object. I say the objective self. You know, you can ascribe it to the to just purely material explanation, or you can see that the will to change. Of course, we reach a point where we're like, "Whoa, is 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 it a kind of inanimate consequence, uh, inanimate effect? Um, are we an animate of an inanimate cause?" So what that means is a, a process that is not intelligent is leading to our intelligence. In, in, in the materialistic domain of thought, because this angle is considered, what it means is free will and you thinking you're a person right now is pretty much electrons hallucinating. It's atoms hallucinating. <laughs> the you that exists is what is it? It's the periodic table and nothing more. And, you know, if I was a true materialist, I'd get a angry, you know, at anybody who thought they were more than the periodic table. So that would immediately render secular culture's philosophy strangely is empty. This is why I feel Zen masters get along in the West, you know, with any kind of, <laughs> do you know? It's like, oh, you, you see emptiness too? Oh, yeah, I see emptiness too, you know? It's like, oh, we're best friends in emptiness. <laughs> Yes, so what comes after the duality? So everything and nothing is, is duality. So Windsor, when you say from zero comes one, and then from one, it, there is everything and nothing. So everything and nothing is duality. So you had zero, then you had the number one, then you went to the number two, which is everything and nothing, right? So what is after that, I'm asking you? And feel free to answer, you can take your time. But I... <laughs>
to be honest, it's like, for how long can the hero punch bad guys? For how long? For it's like, eventually it will be hell. You know, it's like, imagine Superman had to save so many people that he's like, what is this? I can never meet my girlfriend. Like, <laughs> I don't have time. You know, what is this? And so the person, you, you have to, like, there is something that because, because we are, civilization has a sort of good natured momentum to it. Due to our empathy, what do you mean by the eight bits Windsor in the chat section? I would agree with you if the eight was turned a little bit ninety degrees. <laughs> Okay, so this is interesting. I'll tell you how I perceive it. Uh, after the dualistic dimension, I simply, for the sake of uh, the whole species, I say just acknowledge it's the infinite. Du with the moment you have duality, you can have endless projections of that duality, just like how a person can entertain you know, the, scientific the scientific theory of parallel reality. So I feel, yes, there will come a moment where your mind will feel it's uh, in the, sub the subject, it's eternally free to animate. That's kind of like, it was the v Vedic tradition has an incredible wisdom about on this. And they say that Rama, Rama, this um, archetype of the perfect kind of divine man, you know, some person comes and asks him, and he's like, yo, man, why do we have to work in this life? What is the advantage to, to us working? You know? Rama looks at the guy and says, gives an incredibly multi-dimensional answer and he looks at the guy and he says know this that in the lesser dimensions in if we were if we consider reality was multi-dimensional Rama is telling this guy in lesser dimensions the beings are not evolved enough to realize they are responsible for their experience so they are lost in nature's instinctual loop patterns I mean, Rama doesn't say, like, say it like that. <laughs> but, but what Rama says, Rama says is that pe beings in lesser dimensions, they can't access the question of, of, of self. -over. You know, they can't even access that state. They can't fathom it. They're still in a, you know, uh, nature's running them. You know, human beings run themselves. That's the cool thing about our evolution, you know. So, so that's why I say there's nothing wrong with having an ego. There's nothing wrong with wearing a jacket one day. <laughs> you know, just it's, there's something wrong if you wear a jacket and you think you're that jacket and that jacket is worn all the time. It's like, no, okay, that's when you have a, you can get angry at an ego, you know, when the jacket uh, should be taken off because it's like, like imagine the person has 10 jackets on in summer and they go up to the person and they're like, Yo, man, why are you wearing 10 jackets in summer? You know, it's such hot weather. Why are you wearing 10 jackets? And the guy's like, like kind of like passing out because of heat, too much heat. And the guy just says, because my ancestors gave me these jackets, because these are programs of my lineage that I must continue. And so you're like, okay, man, okay. But it makes sense if you take off the jacket and it doesn't mean you got to throw away the jackets. People think when, when you get rid of the ego, you got to get rid of your jacket, you know? There was a time I had an old jacket and I was in a unique state of mind then. And I just, I was like, it was, it was like a really old jacket that was, um, it had lived its life, you know? <laughs> and so what I did was I was in a downtown area and it was a hot, it was not a hot day, but it, like the day, it was a warm night. And so I just took off this jacket and just threw it in the street. Not not in, in front of cars. I mean, just threw it in the sidewalk. You know? Just, just as a sort of kind of my own maverick kind of uh, 
self-entertained artistic vision. You know? <laughs> Sometimes you got to realize it's there's also nothing wrong with chaos. There is something wrong when chaos wants to define the whole system. The whole point of this life is not for us to all be clones in happiness. The point of this life is that the uniqueness is now being comprehended in a multidimensional way. So the same way language was discovered, now there's deeper conceptions upon language being discovered. And the reason I chose the name Mr. Within, guys, because I thought that name actually, um, it's not a noun. Like, it's a strange noun, you know? And the reason, the reason I chose the name is because who is looking right now? That means if, if you had heard no thought, nothing, who is looking? There's this story, guys. I gotta tell you this. This this kind of Vedic. Oh, so I I didn't finish the Rama story. Sorry. So so Rama looks at the guy and the, who had asked him why should we work in this life, and he says those beings in the lesser dimensions they don't they can't even ask the question, and then he says those beings in the higher dimensions, the demigods, the gods who are get, being given offerings by the people, you know those gods they can't. They don't even have the. T it's like they're being given everything, you know, to such a degree that they can't. They don't even need to ask. They're in such a heaven. It's like why leave heaven, you know? Rama says it is this human life is a blessing because you have a balance of kind of the heavens, the, par the paradise of the mind, and you also have gets tired of the eternal war and just evolution arises. You can play with dualities uh, endlessly. That's the pretty much the purpose of the dualistic dimension. What does that mean? That means just look at any object in, in front of you. Now, if you were to define that object, you need a dual concept of a good or bad or, or a sort of spectrum of consideration to identify the uniqueness of that object. There has been times in my life, I will say, that I've experienced what I call divine attention. It was a unique state of mind where I noticed the unknown moving uh, what I felt I knew. So it's like most people identify with their subjective realms, but when you get to observe it, you realize no room is truly empty when you're in it. So, so ultimately, intelligence is echoing through its own design. And so when you can discriminate what is your own echo and what is not your own echo, then you become entertained by how the unknown moves, but not as an archetype, not as a character in a story. It's like the character and story thing is put on pause and the guy, who, person who was playing the video game is now gone and just sat in the grasslands, in the pure land. So yeah, it is, you can totally live a life that is non-dualistic oh, and uh, this is the second story I wanted to share the story is being said by the disciple of some guru and he says one day some person comes to the temple and says to this guru this man with like a very intense personality and uh, like angry and like very forceful and he says you, you you people say you're enlightened and if you're enlightened you're going to give me a mantra right now and i'm going to get enlightened give me a mantra give me a mantra give me a mantra like this guy came into the temple and it's like as if it's a store and he's asking who's the where's the manager <laughs> he's just gone in the temple and uh he's gone in the temple and he's telling he's forcefully asking to get something and there's something off in the moment, and the guru says no. You know, it's like, what is this? 
You know, the guru is like, who are you, man? <laughs> no, the guru doesn't say that. The guru tells the guy, you're not ready. And the guy says, no, you have to. And the guru at some point feels like the stubbornness of the guy is strangely like as if maybe the, maybe he has to listen to the mullet. And so the guru, guru sits down, closes his eyes, a sort of kind of sacred chant comes to him and he tells this guy this mantra. And this guy goes in a room and the, um, now the disciple um, and the guru and all those people who are outside for one week, this guy's in this room endlessly like a, like a machine just repeating this mantra. It's like the person had a strange determination, this guy. But he had also arrogance. And arrogance is your blind, blind spots are slowly accumulating. So what happens? Is that after a week, the disciple says this guy comes out of the room. And there's actually a glow about him. There's something totally different. But it's strange. It's like they don't know how to respond. And then the guy comes to the guru and says, I am enlightened. I am on in everything. I see this guy over here. That's Brahma. I see that object there. That's Brahma. Everything is Brahma. I am Brahma. You are Brahma. We're all Brahma. He says, I see it. And the guru is like, hold on a second. <laughs> the guru, the guru um, is surprised. But as the story unfolds, he doesn't, he feels there's still something off. And somehow he gets this intuitive kind of in, intent to tell this guy to go buy vegetables. And so he gives the guy a basket and like the money. And he says, go buy vegetables, you're enlightened, go buy vegetables for everyone. <laughs> it's like, and they were living as monks, they were living a very simple life, you know? That means when you live a simple life, I mean, you'll see complexity, but you also realize the advantage of simplicity, you know? As to live a simpler life means you see less and therefore you get bothered less. But if you become responsible uh, for your sight, the more you see, actually, you, you are energized by it because it's important experience to be for you. So anyways, anyways, this guy goes to the market, this guy who sees Brahman everywhere. He goes to the market and, you know, this, this little kid is running around playing like with a soccer ball or something. And he's like, I see Brahman in this kid. And I see Brahman in this like soccer ball. <laughs> And he says, I see Brahman in the snow flower, you know, uh, outside of, you know, the speaker, the storyteller's, you know, house. <laughs> and uh, this man is seeing Brahman. Seriously, he, he has reached the level of experiential attain attainment where he's recognizing non-duality. So he's going and he sees nature. He sees like a monkey on the tree and he's like, I see Brahman and he's in this sort of kind of bliss of singularity, a singular bliss. <clears throat> that means the universe is rendered singular and it's like blissful because one thing is less than, less than everything else to worry about. You know, if everything is one thing, you just worry about one thing and one thing is everything. You know, but so, so there's a, it's, it's an evolutionary, it's a strength of people's minds to see beyond the singular and the dualistic. But I'll, I'm, I'll get to that. Anyways, the story unfolds. This guy goes to the market. He suddenly sees people are running. And he hears the noise of an elephant and some guy runs, you know, runs, people are running and the guy comes up to him and he's actually kind of like a bit overwhelmed at this point, you know. And so the guy comes and tells him, grabs his shoulder and it's like, hey man, don't go there. Don't go to the market. There's a crazy elephant. And this guy is suddenly, his divine ego kicks in. <laughs> he's like, don't worry, man. You know, I see Brahman in that elephant. I see Brahman everywhere. It's like, I'm enlightened. Don't worry, I got this. <laughs> The guy goes, the guy goes and he, what do you, what do you say? He goes to, he goes to the market. He doesn't listen. He goes to the market and he sees the elephant and he just slowly goes and picks up the vegetables, puts it in the basket and puts the money on the stands, you know, and as he has all the vegetables in the basket and right before he goes, he's like, let me go. This is God. Let me go communicate to God. 
he goes in front of the elephant and the elephant is there and he's as if saying like I see Rahman in you you know and there's a moment where the elephant is silent and the guy is silent and you know if this was a National Geographic thing it's like the narrative would say are they bonding right now or like <laughs> and so what happens what happens is the elephant is actually crazy it has been so bewildered and hurt that it's like it's like a cornered animal so it's like that's chaos automatically so the, ele the elephant grabs this guy and throws him throws this guy and this guy kind of suddenly he, he's suffering like injuries you know like and this elephant kind of like attacks this guy and the guy goes to the hospitals and that night there is no vegetables you know <laughs> and so the next day the guy is released he had minor injuries and he's released and he comes back in the temple very angry and he's like the mantra you gave didn't work you're no guru you're not enlightened da, 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 da. like 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 a machine gun on a machine gun of like uh personal bias you know <laughs> And what happens? The guru says, tell me the story. And the guy tells him exactly what happened. And he points out something incredible to the guy. And he said, you saw Brahman in everything except the guy who told you not to go in the market. And this guy suddenly realized how his desire to be something was not allowing him to access the real thing. And its desire was a kind of like hidden promise of intent. The mind, trust me, is so advanced. You, it's like when, when you see a young child take a teddy bear and it's like, this teddy bear is my best friend. The child is animating that toy. Into, its, into a character, into a personality. And trust me, the mind is so advanced that it's as if you don't, you don't need to even do it to that. You can do it in your subjective realm. The subjective realm is, is like a pure land of... Uh, is a, the subjective realm is a pure land of uh, uh, unconditional evocation. The sounds of our world, guys. I don't know if you can hear it. You definitely hear it, I think. So guys, I'm just going to mute for like a minute. I think this truck's going to leave. Okay.
Hey guys, um, thanks for tuning in. I mean, this truck noise is ridiculous. It's still going. So I, I turned it on mute so the noise... Okay. Just a second. Okay, guys, the <clears throat> it's perfect to speak now. Beyond the mask of language, uh, there's the presence of unknown experience. This unknown experience needs to be studied. Uh, every person's inner realms now could potentially be a resource, a resource for others. What it means is really um, minds are stepping uh, out more than their bodies. And that's what communication is. And this communication, its purpose is in, in design. in the making, in other words. Sometimes, guys, I, I don't know. I don't know why I feel we have to study communication 
uh, as a species in more advanced ways. I feel there's nothing left really. We are on a rock in the middle of nowhere. In other words, kind of rendering us as alone in the cosmos. And so because we are alone in the cosmos, what are our options? We only live as just purely physical creatures, only mobility based. Or we bring forth movements of the mind. And it's realizing that your eyes are a unique DNA, so you automatically hold a unique value. Whoever you are, your eyes are open to the world, which means there is a worldview. And that worldview can be useful for uh, what I feel will be Civilization 2.0. That's going to be cool, you know. Hopefully I live to see the seed sprout, you know, that we create a new identity with a freedom beyond the dualistic dimension. We have the compassion of the void. And we have the excellence of the infinite. Really what it is, is humanity is a light in the darkness. And I don't mean metaphorical darkness, I mean actual darkness, you know. And so this rare sense, like it, it's kind of really unique. Uh, life is when reality feels artificial, um, life, life becomes surreal. I remember looking into Rishi Vyasa and at some point it was strange that I was really drawn to certain moments in my life. I had, I've heard certain, you know how some people have this playful kind of idea where they're in the new, you know, Buddhists probably have this kind of idea. Not probably, I mean like they definitely do, but uh. You know how a person can feel like they, they when they see someone, they feel they, the person feels familiar to them? And the Buddhist may say, I knew this guy from a past life, or, or I knew this gal from a past life. Even you might even see like an animal and feel like you, you, you're familiar with that life force. The companions of the, of the human being seem to be only humans, but the companions of the, you can say, mind are not just visible phenomena. The mind has access to what I call one subtler planes of abstraction. So how you treat your imagination is first realizing it is a room your eyes have access to. So we are all starting in the caves of our subjective potential. <clears throat> and so th then it becomes really fascinating, you know, because the system has to, because the language is dualistic, ultimately human, human beings have been defined out of a retaliation uh, of order against chaos. So, you know, so what that would ultimately mean is that we're trying to keep something alive in the dualistic dimension and we can't tell yet, are we the caterpillar? Could all of this be hollow and we, the, the, the total consequence is a different direction or a different dimension? Or is it just this? And really what we have is as like kind of survivors on an island, it's like we're just, what are we? Like what are human beings? What, what are human beings? They are moments of consciousness, correct? There are moments of conscious intelligence. Now, even before we get into debates of uh, wondering what it, what the human being really is, you know, or 
<clears throat> which came first, the chicken or the egg or the mind or the body? You know, before we get into that kind of game, Trust is the greatest uh, force. It's the only thing you can really do in your subjective realms. When you distrust something, you don't participate in it. When you don't participate in it, you identify as an observer. And if you remain too much of an observer in your life, the voice of your environment is going to move you. So you're going to strangely have the same outcome. So, so it, regardless of what sort of spiritual inclination or metaphysical path the person takes, the purpose is not to escape. You're not trying to escape karma. You're just being simple enough to see how the complexity is arising. So anyways, guys, I, I, I feel I will end this talk. And um, um, society is a linguistic masquerade. But it's an incredible thing that after 4 billion years, the science project has arose. So at least every living human being must at least, I feel, you know, it's not, it's not enforced, but if you care for the world, you listen, 10% of your life attempt, attempt to live as a collective being. Because really, when you really confront existential emptiness, you don't have time. You don't have time to think you're enlightened or you realize what is at hand. It's like it's it's like those those people who feel enlightened in this world is is I mean, like I don't want to say too much, but I, but I'll say like. There's no point of holding a banner, when the battle is still continuing, the banner of victory. It's like there's no point of holding assuming victory when the war is going on, and the war is a return to life. And life is kind of being slowly, it's like, it's kind of strange. We stepped out of the food chain and then what was the replacement? Um, just like how people were worshiping objects, then they went into towards worshiping language, language worshiping, as I said. <clears throat> Similarly, it's, it's like we went from surviving like a savage animal in the food chain into escaping and coming into a domain where we, 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 for the first time, could create the conditions of our life. Do you know what that means? That means uh, it's such a blessing to be alive now because a lot of that animalistic food chain, while human beings were running away from, like, savage beasts, you know, From savageness, we escape. We didn't escape. We stepped out into somewhere towards somewhere better. When you treat life like a journey, you do, you can't uh, get upset from your past anymore. But if you treat life as just what what the snapshot of the moment is, that snapshot, the snapshot, the mind can. <clears throat> how can I tell you? I've had moments where. Uh, playfully, I say, my mind was breaking me. And what I mean by that is I was caught into, I, I was having a dark night of the soul and uh, I was caught into a sort of loop, loop pattern of self-depreciation. I was reducing myself in front of myself. I was completely alone, but my psychological pattern was, I was just, I was, I was becoming the wrath that, um... I felt the the past me deserved, you know, and it was a strange moment until I realized it was looping and then I got bored. So the easiest way to handle stress and depression is to get bored from it and realize we're just living creatures. It's an unknown terrain. Uh, our knowledge is, is as far as we can see and then we move, we march. And where is humanity marching? Uh, that was a, this is a very d deep question, but I eventually got a great answer from it from this Japanese show. 
and um, Japanese writers and stories are next level for me. I have a strange kind of respect for uh, the stories that emerge from Japan. Pretty much the scene in this Japanese show was that <clears throat> these giants were kind of eradicating humanity and it was uh, all the veteran troops, all the experienced soldiers had died and there was this unfathomable kind of foe. And so all that was left was these kind of new, um, new soldiers who had just entered the force. And suddenly the general realizes, the commander, his name's Ervin, he realizes suddenly that excuse me he realizes pretty much that the only strategy is that there are all the troops and soldiers are going to die anyways so the best thing they can do is distract distract the main opponent and they send like this elite soldier to go kill the bad guy so it's like the general commander looks at the elite soldier and says i will most have to die with the soldiers because the soldiers won't run in battle alone right but you must do this Right. And so it's it's that moment where the, you know, the commander's kind of elite soldier friend is like a, is a close friend of us. And so it's like the, the it's, so what happens is the commander goes and the elite soldier goes. Right. Um, and the commander comes and sees all like the soldiers shaking, paralyzed with fear, hopeless. And one of the soldiers is broken down earlier. And it's like, what are they? They say you put one apple, bad apple, in a barrel of apples, and all the apples go bad. You know, so one person's fear, like a flame, can make many people suddenly afraid, you know? <clears throat> but anyways, what happens is Commander Erevin arrives, and he says, Soldiers, this is our last operation. And all the soldiers, even though they're there, they're very scared and paralyzed. And in some sense, they're new. They're like, they, re they don't know anything yet. They don't know enough to be kind of like disciplined. That much and so they're paralyzed with fear because of their opponent and so commander Erwin says <clears throat> our plan is to rush at the enemy and this is the our final operation and suddenly one of the scared soldiers is like so commander Erwin are you saying that it's meaningless that it doesn't matter if we um or we uh, like we should fight rather than we should run away because we're all gonna die and commander just fearlessly looks at the soldier and says yes and then the soldier is kind of broken as if it's his last moment he's alive and the soldier looks at commander Erwin and says is life meaningless then and then commander Erwin says no even though we are in a cruel condition of nature and we're all gonna die but life is not meaningless we live for those who will want to find the meaning to life we live for those and it was for a second, it's like the rage and rebellion of consciousness against the cruel conditions of its dimensions, rendering the ultimate precision of the pre presence. So Commander Ervin kind of says to his soldiers, he's kind of inspiring them, he says, every person dies. You know, and this is, it's like you have free will and it's like your, your free wills, like you uh, maximizing your free wills effort is like the greatest last rebellion against the cruel condition of existence. So it's as if free will, as, as Dylan Thomas says, rage, rage against the dying of the light. <clears throat> and in the show, of course, all the soldiers go and die. But they, they are no longer dying with paralyzed fear. They are dying in the sense that regardless of the inevitable condition, uh, you know, they are, they are marching. They are running towards it. They're, not that they're running towards it. They're fear. They're not, I mean, they were all in the show. They're all afraid and kind of going to inner, inner nostalgia but at, at the, before they die. But it's like there is, there is this crucial factor that they did something in the void that was not done before they they moved they they expressed they continued 
Really, that is the common denominator. That is the advanced human. That which cares for the continuity of the greater potentials of intelligence. That means if you if you accept this civilization, you know, in, in on some sense, yes, you have to, you have no choice. But you know, but on another level, if you accept it, you don't accept anything else. So what that means is many old ancient systems remain, but the mo the modernity and capacity and potential of the human being has accelerated. So what I feel is like this slingshot effect of intelligence that the way the sto the way this um. <clears throat> The stories where we tell ourselves have defined us in a limited way, but then we suddenly see something deeper has been cultivating throughout the whole life. This mystery, this phenomenon of who am I? What am I? And I understand it's not something to dive too deeply into because I'm telling you it comes as a round circle. There was this, um, <clears throat> like this, uh, some, somebody had posted this picture on Facebook in some group that it was showed this guy who was a like a businessman you know it was a cartoon not cartoon like car, like it was um like a, you know how it was like a it was like a newspaper picture you know one of those kind of old school newspaper cartoons and whatever but anyways like the whole thing was it was it was drawn by hand and so <clears throat> in the picture <clears throat> excuse me In the picture, the guy is just in, in town with his briefcase and suit. And in the next part, you see the guy is climbing a mountain with a giant beard. And he's dressed all traditional. And he has a stick. And he's going up the mountain to find the yogi. And on the top of, it, uh, on the top of that picture, it said, like, whatever the guy's name was, let's call, call him Bill. It was like, Bill found his true self. And the guy goes, in the, and it shows that he's walking up towards a cave. And at the inside, the cave is himself with the briefcase. He realizes he was trying to avoid something that was actually a dimension of life to confront. And there's joy with confrontation. Trust me, uh, when you confront your fears, what happens is you, you attain a sort of relief. That relief is worth confronting your fears. But confronting your fears doesn't mean be foolish. So anyways, guys, we're all, we're all, I find, ultimately have the intention of not just building an advanced civilization, but to have the human being in the civilization be able to acknowledge itself in advanced ways. You know, and life is a very incredible changing process. That means who you are now listening to my talk in a couple of years, if you listen to this, you'd be totally somebody different. You know, I, I even sometimes listen to my talks and I see like the shifts and the landscapes and the various perceptions that I entertain, you know. So I, it, it, trust me, you can always look at a picture of yourself and wonder who you really are. But it's, it, the reality is more than the pictures. <clears throat> so I feel what is the best thing we can do? People begin roaring out their inner realm somehow. That means you realize because every day happens once and objectively we, what is it, let's say 100 years. I feel <clears throat> I sympathize with Jon Snow from Game of Thrones when he was told, you know nothing, Jon Snow. And I feel humanity 
doesn't know anything, therefore is it falls the burden of existence falls on the responsibility of that which is the most animate. I realize rather than a belief game, rather than constantly changing the subjective landscape, it was e I noticed that you can just re not identify with the subjective landscape even. There are moments where you can attain such an ananda by just staying quiet sincerely. Sincere quietude is, is, he, is, is strangely heals, heals the game. Anytime you, you abide by your sincere self, you heal. Your intelligence naturally functions. Karma stops freaking out. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, uh, I appreciate um, the years. And really, everything is either in motion or static. And beyond our comprehension of static and motion, I feel the mind will get to a point where not only it will entertain galactic archetypes, it will begin to kind of realize that the distinction between how the mind is being the self and the world is the same moment. So when that realization comes, I say truly when that realization becomes mainstream, it would be for the first time and the first apocalypse of the educational realms occurs the first destruction of language. We have built a civilization through a certain language. Suddenly we're discovering this language hollow. It will be the era of the new, I say the advanced communicators. So it's as if what's happening is that of course, inevitably there could be an extinction. It could, it could all just be uh, an appearance of forces and there is no greater meaning. You can totally entertain and be as secular as that. But, but I am saying that there is, like you can't ignore, you know, the imagination. You cannot ignore that which uh, animates the new. And that which animates the new, I feel we linearize it. We, the human being, pretty much freaked out it was alone and gave a personality to the cosmos. Gave a personality to the unknown. Now that personality is reflecting the self, so it's like man is limited to his design. <coughs> so ultimately, man is made in God's reflection because anytime man considers God's reflection, it's him. He sees him, himself. So this is why in action, this is where I say you got to also be a bit, bit of a Taoist here, where action through inaction. There are moments where you can just like, I, I, I say piloting, so that means various elevations. The mind can even open up various subjective spectrums. Like, <clears throat> tr trust me, like when you trust your mind, it trusts you strangely. I don't know why the world works this way. I mean, I know to, to my, in my personal way, but like there is something incredible about this life that when you unauthentically chase something, it... It's as if your mind subconsciously doesn't feel you deserve it, so it makes your hand own hand slip. So this is why it, the inner life must be stabilized before truly you can administer yourself in the outer life. But at the same time, we find if the body is not healthy, how could the mind be? But still, innovation stands. And really what the voice, what, why we, we have voices as human beings is to speak, you know, we say to speak out. But what is, what, is, what is being spoken is like, it's literally the vocalization of the inner realms. Language is a great uh, networking kind of process. You know, you see, you see like a bunch of birds fly in the sky together, you know, rhythmically in patterns, wave patterns. You see fish swim together. You see wolves run together. You see lions and their pride. <clears throat> but when you look at humanity, we don't, we don't move that way, but we are on like a more advanced level, have ways where our, we judge each other's expression. Right before, uh, we wouldn't even care. We would like reactively when we were in the food chain in our history as human beings, as, as beings. Um, 
like we weren't homo sapiens yet, but I'm saying like what it was, was just re savage reaction. It was literally like if, 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 if we were to translate back then now, it would be like two people looking at each other and just by seeing their each other is different. It's imagine th they want to get rid of each other. And it's kind of like the insecurity of the other. Those who are, who, I say this is a sort of, uh, a sort of subconscious fear of the dark, you know? And that fear of the dark is in some sense, how would I say it? The fear of the individualization of the unknown. That means for some people, if they really think they are a certain persona, uh, anything outside of that persona can freak them out. <laughs> The, that persona is like the lens in front of the camera. You can take it out and it's like, yo, man, my ego just changed. How can I get rid of my ego when it's changing all the time? <laughs> because there is the concept of ego is ultimately just where attention is. So really, this is what I consider to be true self-inquiry, where you're studying how your attention is being the moment with a sensitivity that there was you experienced you were a child you were a creature before you learned language so what is incredible about the silence silence is like the foundation for the noise you know stillness is the foundation for movement and so when we come and wonder what is beyond stillness that stillness became a veil so I think in mystical thought, there will different traditions will be inclined towards two types of veils. You know, one veil is thought and the other veil is emptiness. That means imagine emptiness is not emptiness, it's a curtain. And we just do not see beyond that curtain. In ancient traditions, they acknowledge five elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Like that was the old school periodic table. <clears throat> so why did they consider ether as an element so that means they saw space and they felt space was an element so anyways guys <laughs> thanks for tuning in um i say this I, I feel every human being is an advanced communicator because they're an advanced communication of their universal sector. And really the advantage of free will is that you can pilot your conscious attention. And when you find a sort of a comfort, uh, contentment with the way life moves, you no longer resist it. Therefore, meaning you, you get less locked in your inner realm and you actually see more of life in your conscious waking state. Some people are awake, they live, they go and see something, but they're so caught in a sort of relationship of having to identify to, with something for their survival that they kind of forget that there's a sort of strange freedom before all the have-tos psychologically. So... <clears throat> The greatest freedom is one that was always there. I, f I feel that the person who finds that freedom understands why light is why the light why light is in their eyes. I feel that's a sort of ultimatum to enlightenment, where you tr realize the true presence and vastness of the intelligence that is here, that is being you. That it's as if, the, if your mind has a capacity, has an ability to identify with the inferior, with less weak, weak archetypes, the mind also has an ability to identify with um, kind of uh, greater archetypes. It's like all the times that you felt uh, um, you, look, you looked down on yourself, you could have also looked up. You know, and so by listening to your own intelligence, you suddenly learn to look up in a way that you trust. You know, so in 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 the expression of human activity, um, uh, the fields of memory become consciously evoked, and so what occurs is that each memory is a hidden worldview. So just like how a bunch of atoms 
you know, uh, become a molecule. Similarly, it, it's it's kind of like a bunch of world views identifying with certain long term kept um, senses of self, kind of all infusing. Man's greatest tool is not, by the way, an object. It is the awareness to how far subjects go and, and truly how vast the, that unconditional freedom behind your eyes is. The unconditional freedom of that whole um, duality of the within and the without, that when you truly go within, for the experiencer, there is no duality. It's a non-dualistic being. But when you are we look without, you can't be anything more than a dualistic phenomenon. You know, we we need references to be individual. It's like the concept of individuality and collectivity are two sides, uh, two sides of the same coin. They are codependent, rendering them both existent simultaneously. <clears throat> If Jean-Paul Sartre was here, he would say those would be existence, uh, existence. <laughs> so the word exist and the word tent and the word S. <laughs> Sorry, not the word S, the, the letter S. <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and honesty.